Good morning, ladies. It's so good to have you here. I want to welcome you to the Sunday School class for Women in the Word that meets together on Sunday mornings at 945. And we would normally meet at Worth Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, but we can't do that right now. So we are meeting together on Facebook and YouTube. So let's get started this morning with a word of prayer. I know that uh, if you are a member of our church and we have your email address on file, Miss Karen sends you a prayer list every week now. And so we do have those prayer lists that we can use to pray for each other. And I hope you are doing that. And I am not going to mention everybody this morning, but I would like to mention just a few. So let's take a time to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we have together. And I pray that you would touch our hearts with the remembrance of some of our friends and some of our acquaintances and even friends of friends who need prayer at this time. We know that there's a lot going on and we know that there are things that are related to COVID. We know that there are things related to racial tension. We know that there are things not even related to anything, but they're on our hearts and our minds and in our families that we need prayer for. And I pray that you would just touch each situation, insert yourself on our behalf into the situation to make it work for your honor and glory. I pray that you'd be with our class this morning and our services today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's start with a couple of songs. I want to start with Jeremiah 33.3 3 this morning. Jeremiah 33.3 3 is a very short verse and a very short song. There's a little bit of repeating. I don't know if you've heard it before, but let's try it. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. And show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. All right, very simple reminder to go to God in prayer for the things that we need. Then I want us to sing Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. And again, I don't know if you know this one or not because I don't think we've sung it in class. So, uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, if you've found it. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Ye are dead, ye are dead, ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life was hidden with Christ in God. All right, that one's a little bit harder to sing. You can't get your breath. And then there's one more song I want us to sing, and that's a song from our hymnal. And uh, the words are, for I'll live for him. And since that's what our lesson is about this morning, I thought that would be a good song for us to sing. It's, uh, I'll live for him. My life, my love, I give to thee, thou Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. 
we're just gonna do the one verse. Are you ready? My life, my love, I give to thee, thou Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for thee, my Savior and my God. Okay, let's get into our lesson today. I told you I was going to be talking about death, and that's what I'm going to do. And uh, it's talking about living in order to die well. In our chapter, in, our, in the book of Genesis is where we found our text. And remember, this is the second half of um, the lesson that we had last week. Because there was just too much material to put all in one lesson. We're going back to Genesis 1, 26 through 28, talking about creation. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Alright, and last week we also talked about the three types of living. And uh, one was squandering, that was purposeless living, where we just let Things come as they come. We don't try to do anything proactive. We don't try to do anything ambitious. We just live and let live. We Or we pursue selfish or temporal aspects of our life and want to do more just for doing more and not for living for God. Or we could do the spending life, where we spend without replenishing, spend and spend and spend and spend. No resting, but it all relies on what we can do in ourselves. Okay, those two are the types of lives that we are not supposed to live, obviously. And then the third kind is stewarding our life and that's what this whole series about is about for the next uh, three months we'll be talking about stewarding our lives we recognize God as the giver and the sustainer of life and we know that God provides and replenishes our resources living for his purpose and glory is our goal so today we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God over life because God is the one who's in control. He is the only one that's in control if uh, we're talking about life itself, the giving and the sustaining of life. Because he gives it to us in the first place. And he's the one that says when our life is over. In the giving of life, we think of several women in the Bible and women now, even in our day, who were childless and they went to God in prayer asking for a child and God gave them the child. Uh, remember Sarah in Genesis 18, 13 and 14, and the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? And she did, and she thought she was too old. 
But then God reminds Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. God can do what man thinks is impossible. And then we remember Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, 5, and 19 and 20. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. We're talking about Elkanah. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her, because she had prayed at the temple. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the Lord gave me my request. And then we remember in the New Testament, Elizabeth. Luke 1 through 7. Uh, no, Luke 1, 7. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. But then the, the angel came to Zacharias and said, You're going to have a son. He, of course, didn't believe him. He was struck uh, speechless, and he couldn't talk until he acknowledged everything was as the angel had said. And when the child was born, he said his name is John on the piece of paper writ written out. And as soon as he said that, that's when his speech was restored, because he was the promised son that would go before Messiah. John the Baptist. So, what about modern times? Do you know of anybody who was without a child for the longest time and they thought they couldn't have children? And um, then they decided to adopt. And about that time, God sent them a child. And sometimes it was I've, I know of several instances, and sometimes it's right before the adopted child comes, and sometimes it's right after the adopted child comes. I, God can open or close the womb, and sometimes He doesn't decide to do that. He does. He decides not to have the open womb for the child to be born, but that's His plan for each woman, and we can rest assured that he's got our best interests at heart. And it's hard for us to understand sometimes, but we have to trust God because he loves us so much and he knows what we can handle and what we need and what he can use the circumstances for in our lives. Uh, I'm thinking also of Sonia South, our missionary to Turkey. Um, they had just put out a letter saying they have decided to adopt a child. And um, lo and behold, they are expecting an, their own um, creation, I guess you'd say, procreation, um, in October, I think it is, something like that. So, and then God is sovereign over life in the giving of life and in the blessing of life. Uh, we have choices and we can make the choice for good or for bad, for blessing or for cursing. And Moses even told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 30, chapter 30, verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And they had to make the choice. And Joshua, when he was getting ready to pass off the scene, in Joshua 24, 15, he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because the first part of that verse says, Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God created us for his pleasure. And only as we live to glorify him will we be fulfilled. Jesus further commissioned us to bring glory to God by telling others of his great gift of salvation. To live for God's glory 
is to make spreading the gospel a central part of our lives. In the book of Revelation, God confirms that his eternal purposes of creation and redemption will one day culminate in absolute fulfillment. When, he, when we invest our lives in pursuing God's goals for us, we are assured of victory before we even start. And that's what it's like to have God in control of our lives, yielding the control that we might want to take and giving it to God. And then we, God is sovereign over life, also in the conclusion of life. Sometimes God allows a life to end because of sin, like in the days of Noah. And then sometimes it's just the, a matter of the fact that we all have sinned. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When Adam and Eve were first placed in the garden, they were going to never die. They would live forever. But with the tree of life in there and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that's when they brought sin into the world. And then Romans 5.12 tells, tells us, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And sometimes a life is ended because it's God's will. We trust him to perfectly work all the details of life and death for our good and his glory. He retains his sovereignty over life and the withholding of life. 1 Samuel 2, 6 says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Psalm 104, 29. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Remember Hezekiah in Isaiah 38, 5? Hezekiah was told, you're going to die, Hezekiah. And the prophet told him that. And he immediately turned his face to the wall and said, God, please, I need more time. I want to do more things for your honor and glory. And before the prophet could ever leave the palace area, he turned back around and said, Okay, Hezekiah, the Lord has answered your prayer. You have 15 more years. And, you know, I guess that would be nice to know exactly how long you have so that you can plan and work and do everything that you want to do. But you still just get it one day at a time. So sometimes we just need to decide one day at a time, every day, to do what we would do if it was our last day on earth. In Psalm 73, 17 and 26, re listen to these verses. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So God is in control. He can do with us how, we, how he pleases. So if God gives life, and if God takes life, and even lengthens life, we need to learn to steward our lives according to his direction, according to his plan. Life is too complicated to manage on our own. Even King Solomon, who had been granted supernatural wisdom, said, O oh, now, O oh Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. He t that's written in 1 Kings 3, 7. So even with all his wisdom, he still wasn't really sure how to live his life, the coming out and the going in, because he knew he was going to die one of these days. Life contains a million variables, and some of them, many of them, are out of our control. If we want a life of significance and success, 
we must look to God, the giver and sustainer of life, for instruction on how to live our lives, how to steward our lives. And we must commit to following his direction for consent, for success. So I want you to imagine that um, you're able to write your own obituary. Okay, just think of that. If you are able to write your own obituary and your own um, biography that tells all of your life, and you could choose what to put in, how would it sound? Oh, but wait. We are writing our own obituary day by day. Everything that we do can be potentially part of our obituary, part of our autobiography. Okay, I decided, I know this is funny, strange, weird, I decided to write my obituary this week. And since my sister Ruth is a better writer, she's the, act, the one that actually put it into words. And I just gave her some elements. Now what I did was I gave her the elements of my life that I wish had happened or I hope will happen. So here's how it turned out. Madeline Phipps Gareca, born June 8th, 1957, went to be with the Lord November 31st, 2057. Now, if you know anything about 30 days has September, April, June, and November, you'll know that November only has 30 days, but I decided to die on November 31st, which is not a day at all, which means maybe I won't die. Maybe the Lord will come back before then. Okay, be that. Put that aside. So here's my obituary. Throughout a century of full living, Madeline wore many hats. In her birth family and extended family, daughter, sister, sister-in-law, she was always a favorite. Or at least that's what we'll say until another family member needs something good to say about them. There's no argument at all, though, that she loved her family largely. She was a peacemaker, a confidant. She prayed for each one with the most important prayer request being that each one would accept Jesus as Savior and follow God. Madeline's own salvation was at the age of five at a vacation Bible school. She was a true friend with a listening ear and ready sympathy. A good example, almost always joyful and taking time to make things fun. Soon after college, she began what would become a total of 15 years teaching in Christian schools. As a teacher, she was known for three main things. She instilled a love of learning. Students knew she loved them and wanted them to accept Christ. Students knew that God loved them and had special plans for their lives. Her husband, Joe, said she was a perfect helpmeet. More specifically, she loved him, supported and encouraged him in each endeavor. She gave him godly advice, and she inspired him to follow his dreams of being a Bible preacher and teacher. As stepmother and grandmother to go Joe's children, Madeline always had time for them. It seemed she always knew the right thing to say. She gave godly advice, so they asked for it. They knew she prayed for them by name every day to have godly character and suitable godly mates. <clears throat> Through her Sunday school class, her teaching was a source of inspiration, encouragement, and wise biblical instruction to those who att attended and she enjoyed it immensely. Probably Madeline's most recognized external identity was that of a musician, as she started playing tunes on the piano by the age of three or four, served as pianist in many churches, traveled with her father pastor for music ministry, and continued in various music ministries at Worth Baptist Church 
until 2040. She was thrilled to see several of her piano students move on to serve as church pianists, some of them even becoming piano teachers themselves. One of her favorite verses was Ephesians 5:19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. How can you sum up a life like Madeline's? I can't, but I'll try. She used her God-given talents in service to God by loving people, by being a friend, by giving words of encouragement, peace, inspiration, and faith. She did that partly by living out Paul's admonition to the Philippians. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. She loved God, she loved people. That's a good summary. Okay. Now, like I said, that is something that I aspire to. There are so many things in my past that I wish I could have done a little bit differently. And there is no reason why thinking about some of the things that I want for the end of my life and how I want to be remembered, that I can't do something about that starting right now. And so sometimes we have to think, I'm living my life, I'm living my life day by day. I want to do what God wants me to do. Yes, that's exactly how you should do it. But we can have goals when we ask God how do I want people to remember my life? I want them to remember that God was the center of my life. I want God in the lives of all the people I know. I don't want anybody wishing that I had told them about God. I want, if Christ comes back before I die, and he raptures all of the saved people home. I don't want anybody left on earth that knows me. You know what I mean? I don't want anybody here that I could have told about Christ and his love and his redemption on the cross of Calvary, and I didn't. I don't want anybody here to mourn me. You know how at the end of the obituary they always say she is survived by and it lists the names of people. Well, if I die, there may be some people that are still left on earth that know me. But if I am raptured, I don't want anybody left that knows me because I want them all to be with me in heaven. I do. I want them all to be with me in heaven. So sometimes it pays to stop and think. All right. People plan for babies to be born. People plan for uh, the family that they want to have when they're young. But guess what? We need to plan for the end of our lives as well. Number one. Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Has there ever been a time in your life where you realized that you are a sinner and that you cannot get yourself to heaven through any kind of good works, through any kind of, uh, well, anything that you can do? There's nothing you can do. Have you realized that it's not up to you, that it's up to your faith in Jesus Christ? And you can believe that God is who he said he is. That he sent his only begotten son into the world to save and redeem those who are lost. He gave his life. He gave his blood on the cross of Calvary as a sacrifice for our sins. And if we believe and if we ask
we can be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can't call upon the name of the Lord just for, Oh Lord, help me be a good success. And that's not calling upon the name of the Lord. You have to believe who he says, that he is who he says he is. And that he is your only way of salvation. Admit you are a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And commit your way unto the Lord. If you've never done that before, I pray that you will do that this morning. I pray that you will ask the Father and he shall give it to you. Pray a prayer something like this. Heavenly Father, I admit I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. And I accept him now as my Savior, and I ask him to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Bible says, if we do that, he, we will be saved. And we can walk in the life that God has planned for us. We can steward our life. Instead of just spending it and squandering it, we can steward our lives. Thank you for watching this morning. I pray that you will have a blessed day and a very fruitful week for God's honor and glory. Think about how you want to die and let that be part of your plan for the rest of your life. I love you. I'll see you later.